Hi everyone, and welcome to another exciting edition of Words, Images, and Worlds. Delighted on this episode to be talking with uh, someone who currently has not only the shield of Steve Rogers, but also uh, an <laughs> Iron Man costume. I mean, yes. we're talking <laughs> Avengers headquarters with an R2-D2 <laughs> hanging out with Iron Man, might I add. A, little, a, mini, a mini one, it's a little teeny one there. Yeah, I love it. I love it. <laughs> I'm talking with Nelson, who you might also know as Nelson Farrow, or if you want to go with the full three names, Nelson Farrow de Castro. So there welcome, we Nelson. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for jumping in. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. My pleasure. <laughs> Always delighted to talk with folks that are working in comics, and you also work in music, so I'm curious to hear about some of that work as well. Uh, really enjoy showcasing the creativity of folks like yourself. I'll start out with a couple of titles, and then we can sort of roam through a few questions, if that sounds okay, good. Sure. All right. All right. Um, so one of the things that I know you for is Robocop Prime Suspect. Right. The world of Robocop. Yes. Wow. Yep. As well as Daredevil and a number of Marvel characters. Tons of things kind of all over the place. Uh, mm -hmm. it, the Robocop stuff was actually really early on uh, in my career. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was funny. Um, I kind of got my start. Uh, I was at the School of Visual Arts. Uh, I teach there now, um, mm -hmm. a few days a week. Uh, and I remember more. I, I I was under the impression that Marvel had the RoboCop license at the time. This was like 1990 or something mm -hmm. at the time. And and my teacher, uh, Gene Colan, the great Gene Colan, who you may know from all the great Daredevil and Tomb of Dracula stuff, and he's mm -hmm. just a genius, brilliant uh, artist. Uh, took us up to Marvel on a couple of sort of field trip things uh, to go up there and see the offices. And I had my portfolio with me. And I remember um, showing, the, I think it was Bob Harris at the time, um, showing him some uh, uh, some Captain America pencils I had done. And, and he asked me very nicely to come bring some copies of that, which I thought was just like, wow, you know, the editor wants some copies. And yeah. And then I had, I had then knocked out a painting of RoboCop in like my airbrushing class junior year, uh, this great teacher named Mark Kaplan. And he kind of let me do whatever I wanted to kind of do after. Because I took his class like twice in a row. So we did the projects and then he kind of let me do just things. And uh, so I remember knocking that out and then bringing that back up when I brought my copies. And I said, you know, by the way, here's this painting. And and he was like, oh, that's great. You know, I wish we had still had that license. And I was like, what? It's like, yeah, we don't we do not do it anymore. Dark Horse does it now. And I was like, yeah. oh, okay. <laughs> I was like so, so disappointed. But then he was like, but you know what? He goes, do me a favor. Bring me some copies of this. So I was like, oh, another excuse to go up to the great Marvel comics. You know, yeah, uh, yeah. my chance as a little punk kid to get in there. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I was like, okay. So then I... Did in the same class, I did like a, a Ghost Rider painted cover, which became the cover of Ghost Rider 18. Uh, and so when I brought the Robocop paint covers, the copies back, I said, oh, and by the way, I have this. And he was nice enough to send me over to Bobby Chase's office. Uh, and they they decided to buy it. Uh, it was funny. Jimmy Palmiotti and Mark Texier were in the office at the time. Mm -hmm. And she asked them, like, what do you guys think? Do you think this would make a good cover? And they were like, yeah, it's great. Let's go for it. Which is really nice of them because, you know, um, the cover rate is like rate and a half. So mm -hmm. these guys turned down a, a gig at rate and a half for, for me to get on the cover, which was so nice of them. Uh, and then once I kind of had a published piece for Marvel, I took the, the Robocop to Dark Horse. And they were like, oh, you're working for Marvel. Well, let's see what you got. Oh, this is nice. And then they commissioned three more covers for the Prime Suspect uh series uh which featured a young john paul leon as well who did the penciling and inking in there who sadly died of cancer about two years ago uh, it was a brilliant absolute brilliant penciler and, and inker um sadly but uh so i it, it i actually kind of scored that from sort of a mistaken you know some incorrect decision making i guess you could say and some luck uh, of the dice i guess but yeah that was kind of like a, my first sort of main project where i was able to do covers for that and then we did a, a second series i think it was robocop roulette 
I think was the next like mini series. And then, and then Dark Horse was really good to me. They gave me a lot of painted cover work. And uh, I launched my first uh, creator owned series through them called the Udaemon, uh, mm-hmm. where I did, uh, I started out just doing some eight page stories in um, Marvel Comics. I'm uh, sorry, Dark Horse Presents. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was going to add some Dark Horse which, Presents. Yeah, yeah. Which, which had even some Mobius stuff in the same issue, which was really, uh, which was really kind of, you know, intimidating. But yeah. uh, also <laughs> exhilarating at the same time, and then we ended up uh, doing a mini series, a three issue mini series after that, and uh, that was cool. I was like just fresh out of school. I think it was like nineteen ninety three or something. Yeah. And uh, yeah. oh, it was it was nice. It was it was. Uh, they were they were really good to me. They're great great outfit, Dark Horse. I miss working yeah. with them. Yeah. yeah, I always appreciated the things that they published and continue to publish, of course, but. Uh, I was introduced to comics in the late eighties. And so it was a quick trip right over to dark horse comics to see some of the things that were being created there. Uh, mm-hmm. Probably a little more mature than I should have been reading at the time, but, but it was, you know, really good stuff. Um, curious about the, the days before studying under Gene Colan and uh, curious about when you first knew that comics were the space for you, uh, that initial grab. Oh, that's, I mean, that's a really good question. And I guess I guess most comic guys will tell you the same thing, at least the ones that I know, is we had a knack for drawing at a young age and we love comics. And, you know, uh, I mean, I, I think my mom said the first drawing she remembers me doing was Ernie and Bert on a shoebox cover. <laughs> and, uh, she said she could recognize that it was definitely Ernie and Bert. And even, you know, as... as as you know, uh, primitive as it was. And then, you know, all of my years, I remember drawing dinosaurs and the Starship Enterprise and things mm-hmm. like that. And I think uh, I made my first sort of Spider-Man comic book in like third grade. And then I would do lots of superhero drawings throughout middle school. And I think around like sixth or seventh grade, I said like, you know what? I think I'm going to be a comic book artist. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that was around the same time I started like sixth grade, started playing guitar as well. I sort of discovered heavy metal guitar and, uh, you know, but that was still something that drawing was just something inside me. Uh, I was always kind of considered that the artist kid in the class. Uh-huh. Um, and the escapist nature of comics is just a it's a perfect thing for a kid that age. And especially if you can draw, you know, uh, half of my notes in middle school were just, you know, drawings of Darth Vader and stormtroopers and at ats and Yoda and Spider-Man and things like that. I think I got a, into a little bit of trouble for not taking very good notes. So teachers <laughs> tend to, uh, uh, comment on that from time to time. But, uh, that, I think that was definitely it. And the, you know, and then by high school time, even though I was playing a lot more music stuff, I was still doing illustrations. I was doing like um, painted jackets for my friends for their rock bands on their denim jackets and things like that. And that that took me from the comic book black and white kind of or marker drawings into acrylic paint and then recreating album cover art. And then my the 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 technique started getting better and I started to get some finesse doing these Iron Maiden kind of jackets or Metallica stuff or Judas Priest, these kinds of things. And I started to get some painting chops from, from the denim jackets, you know, earning at 40 bucks here and there, you know. Um, but I still knew, I think in high school, I knew I wanted to be a comic book artist. It was the thing I was the best at. Uh, and I didn't know anyone else who did it, who was better than me in my town, you know, and, and I think that's another thing, too, when people say, well, what do you want to do what you're best at? And you're like, well, I haven't met anyone who out, you know, and there's sometimes there's the older kids. We had the, the Vallejo brothers that were like older than me in school and they had painted some did really good jobs on some jackets and stuff. But I don't think they were into comics or things like that. Um, and then I just kind of knew it. I kind of felt bad. I remember they had like a, a a career day at school and they had all these careers that you could pick from and um. I kind of knew. I'm like, no, I think I'm gonna. I want to draw for Marvel Comics, you know. And nice, uh, nice. I'm yeah. like, someone has to do it for a living. I've been seeing these names: John Romita, mm-hmm. you know, and, and John Buscema, and, and 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 Neil Adams, and Sal Buscema, and John Byrne, and uh, you know, 
all these guys have been working clearly for years and Gene Colan and, and Gil Kane and, you know, so Carmine Infantino has to be, you know, this, this, this has to be a real job mm-hmm. and I want to do that. And, uh, and that was great. And I, 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 I kind of felt bad for a lot of the other high school students who were like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what I want to do when I graduate. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the kind of, I, I felt bad because that's got to be scary. Oh, I'm you sure. Know? Yeah. Yeah. What do you want to do for the rest of your life? Make up your mind now, you know. <laughs> Go ahead and in, write it down and commit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in 10th grade, write an essay on what you want to do for the rest of your life and make up your mind now, you know. <laughs> right. um, so in a weird way, your I guess the um your obsession is kind of a calming thing because you kind of at least have a path. Mm-hmm. you know, that you kind of know you want to go down without any kind of doubts. Mm-hmm. Even though I can tell you now the path of a freelance artist is a difficult one at best. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. um, I don't think many people do this for the money. So it's definitely, a, it chooses you and you kind of have no choice. Yes, you are compelled. You are compelled. Yeah. Uh, Amanda Connor once said to me, uh, it was a great saying, she said, um, some people have a job and some people have a career and some people have a calling. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And those are three very different things. And I think the mindset of each person is is very, very different. And I think things like that, if you, you want to be that Alvin Ailey dancer or you want to be that concert violinist or you want to be, uh, you know, a, a visual artist, you want to be an actor, uh, any of those things you want to be a novelist you want to be a film director it's it's kind of in you and the you're kind of going to do it or die doing it and, right. and, and the guys i know who are successful are the ones who just stop at nothing I, they, um i've been doing i just did recently a soundtrack for some uh, uh some film stuff and, and a tv uh series and the director for the film it's called the martyr maker it was directed by kamala Medu. You may know he used to be one of the jerky boys, uh, if you remember those oh, guys. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Prank calls. A very funny comedian guy, a very talented director. And he's one of those guys who will make movies till he dies. Like they'll he'll go to any length, work with any budget, work, you know. I and I I would have a heart attack doing what he does, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. because he at least with me, it's just you I just do my artwork and that's it. That's what you have to really worry about. But yeah, you know, he's got to deal with all the different actors and you know, shooting locations, and you know, well, I don't want to. I don't like that line. I don't want to do that. You know, <laughs> wrangling all these people and things, and then finding you know distributors and funding and things like that. It, it's got to be in your blood. It, the, like yeah. the dedication, like that. I, there are just some people that, if they don't do this, they'd probably just crawl up into like a little hole somewhere and die. You mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. Uh, it's 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 weird. So it's it's kind of a blessing and a curse. Kind of yeah. thing, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, that's yeah. how you look at it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you're you're continuing to create. You sent me some images from Megadroid. Is it Megadroid? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, so tell us about this. Well, um, I, kind of everything I do for a living has been like, well, what can I do that's pretty good that I think I someone will pay me to do that I like doing. Mm-hmm. So you know, I, I kind of a combination. Of, you know, the freelance comics is is always been a difficult career because there's so much competition. Everybody wants to draw Batman. Everybody mm-hmm. wants to draw Superman and Spider Man. These things. And there's always great young talent coming up uh, that will always take less money than the older guys who have gotten raises over the years, right? So they're they're always looking to swap that out. It's the same thing in Hollywood. There's always the new young actor, right? Who's gonna uh, to have the action franchise or whatever that's normal um so i i i figured if i was going to do comics new comics new characters and it has to be something a little bit different because so much great stuff has been done with comics uh-huh. there are so many great talented artists there are so many great talented writers doing this you know thing so for me i i tried to take all the stuff that i could do and put them all together so being a musician and a songwriter um I wanted to, you know, write these songs and then do stories based on these songs. Cause mm-hmm. you know, I was kind of like heavy metal because I, I found that they had a lot of very fantastic sort of storytelling uh premises, right? Uh so like just the song Iron Man, let's say from uh Black Sabbath, right? Well, mm-hmm. 
Uh-huh. Who is Iron Man, right? Why was he trapped in the great magnetic field? And how come nobody wants him? And why is he getting his revenge? And, you know, why does he live again now? And what, you know, like what, what did these people do to him if he tried to save them? And, you know, yeah. where, where, where is he from? Is he from Staten Island? I want to know. Is Iron Man from <laughs> Staten Island? Because I want to know that, you know. Uh, so I always thought it would be cool to have this song and then be able to extend it with comics. And then you can go do the backstory, the origins, or you can skip forward. And then maybe you can return with another song later on as you get further on in the story. Mm -hmm. Uh, You can return with another song, kind of finishing off the stories, then maybe go back again. And uh, I thought that would be a way to really kind of take the the mythos of it and just extend it and just kind of uh, build it. Uh, So building your comic IP and building the music together. And since I could write songs and I could sing and play guitar and and bass and these kinds of things, a lot of comic artists can't do that. Although I do know a lot of good comic artists, musicians uh, for like Joe Quesada is like quite a good songwriter himself, you know, Uh, quite a few guys are, if you like comics, you kind of like music. And, and also I found that like comic books and heavy metal and sci-fi and horror they really go together very well. Chances are, Mm -hmm. if you like the Terminator movie, you probably like Iron Maiden or something, and you probably like horror movies. Uh, You know, if you like horror movies, you probably like comic books too, maybe, right? You probably like sci-fi. You know, there's this weird sort of group, I think, of those things that go together. And and they kind of, they never age. You know, at Mm -hmm. I'm 54, and the Terminator movie is still as cool to me as it was when I was 14. Like, like it's it's still cool. I'm sorry, right? You know? And <laughs> yeah, I, so it's kind of a fun thing that I think you can um, kind of don't grow out of it. And these things go together. So they're just things that I like. And I think a lot of other people like it. And the fact that um, I can take the two things that I'm pretty good at and put them together. Uh-huh. Now we create something that's a little bit different from just a regular comic book. And this, you know, and even the record is a little bit different as it has some cinematic phrases throughout the uh, album that are really not so much a song. Uh, We have like the first track is Activate, where they activate this giant underground robot that they found hidden in this silo um, under the train yard here in in Queens, New York. And they don't know who built this thing. They're not really sure what it's for, what its purpose is. They don't even know if it was built in the future or in the past. And they have to actually now launch this thing. And they're not really sure what the outcome is going to be. Uh, So like I had this whole launch sequence with the rockets igniting and the everyone at the control desk typing in their things and the 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 siren, "Eh, eh," you know, that kind of thing. And then you can hear the the mega droid taking its giant step inside the the chamber there, the silo. And and then the song starts, you know, so it has these kind of cool cinematic things there's a battle scene a uh, battle for the lower east side which is like a full-on sort of war type battle scene with tanks and bombs and machine guns and guys screaming and things like that Mm -hmm. uh to try and then illustrate to to make it a little bit more of a cinematic experience besides the songs and the comics so you get a little everything's a little bit different and they all blend together i think really well Mm-hmm. So I think this is um, something that is somewhat different than what you would normally get when you get your average Kickstarter comic book of somebody's new character, you know, Chicken Man or whatever, you know, or right or or you know, Goose Girl or you no, know, I'm just I'm just throwing out bizarre names, yeah, although yeah, copyright <laughs> TM copyright 2023. That's Man, right, right, Goose right? Girl's that's mine, that's mine. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, um something different right always trying to push the the boundaries and it's just and it was it really came about of of like what things can i do that i can offer that will make this kind of a a signature thing of me right and something new and different and that's really how this was born just mixing the stuff i love to do right if you do it if you do it if you do it well enough then maybe someone will pay you to do the things you love for the rest of your life and those things if you do them well you create something new and different uh, after this Megadroid project, I have well, one with um, uh, a very cool student of mine uh, years ago. Peter Keen um, was a stop motion animation student at School of Visual Arts, and he created this fantastic punk rock monster band. 
of what and, happened. Yeah, called The Mash. And uh, he did this amazing, amazing thesis. And he asked me to do some music for, he did a behind the music uh, stop motion animation parody. So I wrote some punk rock songs for his thesis. And then he, the animation was so cool. And I'll see if I can, I'll get you some of the imagery that of some of the, uh, the yeah. characters. It uh, has the bride, she's the singer, uh, Creech, uh, and the mummy, and, and the wolfman, who I did the voice of in the little thesis. And um, I, before you know it, I, I kind of have almost a full album's worth of those songs now, like Electrode and Stitch My Heart In, and That Girl's Got Her Hooks In Me. Of course, the creature sings that one, right? Um, <laughs> right. Make Me Howl, that's her talking about the wolfman and their romantic relationship, and uh uh, wrap me up so our love won't fall apart, which is of course the mummy, you know, these, you know, um, <laughs> nice. spooking and puking. Uh, if the coffins are rocking, don't come and knock it. And <laughs> so, you know, these kind of fun, really fun punk rock songs, uh, you know, uh, and I realized that's got to be like the next one because it's yeah. just the, we started writing these and they were so much fun. And yeah, his characters yeah. are so cool and so well done uh, that I knew I had to partner with this really young, talented guy. So that's, you know, after Megadroid, I think this will be a new different thing where he can do animated stop motion stuff mm -hmm. and we can provide the songs for that and do maybe comics based on that to maybe photo oh, comics awesome. using the stop motion figures instead of drawing it. So, um, you know, if you're lucky enough to meet someone that talented who can do something cool and you can, you know, add something that you do well and now you get something different, you know, and again, yeah. so it's these kind of, uh, I think everything's a passion project. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And I think, you know, in today's day and age of the internet and just so much stuff out there everywhere, that your thing almost has to be a ridiculous passion project for it to kind of stand out in any way, especially if you don't have millions in funding and that kind of stuff like that. You yeah, you have yeah. to bring something so kind of unique that you pour your guts into that it becomes, you know... Um, it's something that can't be denied in its original nature, perhaps, mm -hmm. maybe. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, that's just my my take on it. But uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So you know, each trying to trying to come up with the new interesting things that that float your boat, right? And hopefully, you know, I mean, there's an old adage of artists, you know, and you see this a lot with rock bands where you know you don't make the music for the fans, mm -hmm. right? You make the music for you. And if it's good, the fans will like it and like you, right? And if you Absolutely. cater to them, you're never going to give them what they really want anyway, because all the fans want something kind of different, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So if you make that sequel that they asked for, they say, that's not what we wanted. <laughs> you right. do what you want to do. They go, that's not what I was expecting, right? So you can kind of, you kind of have to um, just create the things that you, that you think blow you away. And then mm -hmm. people who like it will like it. And I think if if you have a high standard of what you think is interesting and, and entertaining and exciting, I think then you just get the fans will follow you because of the work itself. So I know that's a it, it's a it's a little philosophy of mine. And uh, I've heard some other people share that one as well. I, I think it has some truth to it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious about by means of a final question where folks can go to find out uh, more about what you're creating, any particular social media spaces, websites, um, things of um, that nature. I have, uh, well, we have the uh, Megadroid Facebook page um, mm -hmm. where we're putting up some of the stuff for the, the, the Megadroid Kickstarter. It's live right now. It goes till uh, November 11th and we're about five fourths funded, uh, but it was a very low funding number. So, uh, and again, it, it's new, right? Um, when someone kind of returns with something that they've been, that's kind of been well-known for a while, they sort of have a built-in fan base. So this is kind of new stuff, but uh, we seem to be doing well, hopefully if everything goes well and knock on wood, you know, uh, by, by the 11th, we'll, we'll get this funded. Uh, so I have the Megadroid page and we also have a, a free Megadroid.com website, which we're, it's a little under construction right now. By the time we're done with the Megadroid uh, we'll be able to have a lot of things that you can download and purchase from there. Um, and then there's my regular Facebook page. Uh, awesome. But the awesome. Kickstarter, if you, of course, uh, 
I'll make sure to send you a link that we can. Yes, it, it'll there. appear right here. <laughs> yeah, and I'm a, if you go to Kickstarter now and just literally type in Mega Droid, it will come up. So I'm sure yeah. if you, you know, put a little search thing with the magnifying glass. Um, and that's it so far. I, I would just want to make sure to concentrate on this. So the, you know, I finished pretty much. The comic has been drawn out mostly. I actually just broke my finger the other day. Oh wow. <laughs> yes. that's commitment I was, I was literally <laughs> dropping off some uh, promotional materials on my scooter and got into a car accident as some guy opened the door and but uh so I might have to hold off on drawing the cover for a while until I can get yeah. just the finger isolated because now it's bonded to the other one so uh once that happens but again like most of it is really done the album has been uh, fully recorded and stuff. It's being mixed by uh, Joey Z from Life of Agony, very, very well-known producer, and uh, Jay Frigoletto, who did like Oasis and Blondie and Alice in Chains and In Excess and like, oh, I mean, wow. you need wow. all the top name guys. So I got like such a great team on it. The colorists are uh, 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 Chris Sotomayor and, and Paul Mounts, who are just like the top guys around. So, mm -hmm. so everything, every aspect of this so far has just been fantastic the my my band i got uh dave lopez on drums who's just amazingly talented progressive heavy metal drummer who's got a really funky interesting kind of groove it's not just your simple math you know it, it there's something to it you know it's not cookie cutter kind of uh drums and eric presti is uh, on bass who's a great uh, uh amazing musician who's actually a great guitar player lent his his skills on bass on this project because he liked it so much. Uh, who else is also is one of the greatest sound guys in the country who helped us engineer the record and get it to sound really good. So, um, you know, uh, it, it's it's almost in the can. It's pretty much like almost ready to go. So we're just waiting till the funding comes in. So the turnaround should be quick for it. So um, I think the longest thing will probably be just waiting from the printer to, to turn around the book, to print the book. Yeah. So you know, yeah. but I do got to get this cast off. I'm hoping in a week I'll get it down to one finger and then yes. I can draw. <laughs> Sending the good vibes. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, well, Nelson, thank you so much for taking some time to talk with me. Thank and you for having me. Yeah. Pleasure to meet you and glad to feature you anytime and really curious to have you back to talk about the stop motion project as well. That'll be really cool. Definitely. I'll, br I'll bring, uh, I'll bring Peter with me uh, and I'll make sure yeah. to get you some of those images. He did, I mean, one of the things that just crushed me, he did this like a shot of them, sort of like a band shot in like a CBGBs mm -hmm. with the stickers all over. The, and each little sticker he had handmade and stuck on the wall and shrunk down. Oh, wow. He sculpted each one of these puppets by himself. Each one is an original design. And it, the, the amount of work that this young, talented guy has done uh, is just amazing. So that's like another one I'm like, you know, once Megadroid is done and I've I've got pretty much the next record for Megadroid is almost done as well. I got about five of the songs are done, ready to get recorded. And then I just have to finish up in about another five songs just with a few parts here and there. So that one's kind of going to hopefully be quick as well. So once we get the mash thing done, but a lot of stuff in the works. So it's awesome. just finding the time, but I'll definitely make sure to uh, I'd love to come back and talk about that and bring him with me. Because uh, it's it's something really cool. I think you'll definitely like it. Yeah, definitely, definitely. It is a plan. We will make it happen. Right. And, and glad to be in touch. And glad to see the things that are on the way. Thank you. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay.